All right, so I'm doing two things here. I'm giving a little bit of background behind Probe in case you have never seen, uh, never taken a PHP class or a TPI class. Uh, well, it won't even cover Probe and TPI. I don't even cover that. So what I'm doing is giving a little background behind why Probe exists. And so uh, this is a new animal. So I'm giving a little background behind why you would use Probe and I'll explain what Probe is in the next, the next slide. <clears throat> and after the overview, how you use it in the size of main template and dashboard. Because again, Probe is the concept in PSP. And you can use lots of different tools to do uh, Probe. The tool in the, the dashboard tool does a phenomenal job. And um, having had the wonderful lecture luxury of teaching the PHP fundamentals multiple times. Uh, I, I know the opportunities get kind of rare for other people, but I've been teaching it every uh, a couple times every year. Uh, I've been able to make some refinements to make it even more effective, I should say, uh, to make it easier to use than the original uh, probe approach, getting ahead of myself. So a little background. Probe stands for proxy-based estimating. I introduced you to the concept of proxies before. This is where proxies come from. The original idea behind proxies was in Probe, and we took that and then applied it to launches. So I've exposed you to how proxy, proxy tables look in the launch environment, like the size of the rocks of a team, a ditch, a white paper, uh, a, a new interface or a new button needs to be added to a display. Uh, these major rocks, to call them that, that team would say, we're going to do these things in the next three months. This use of probe here, a proxy of proxies, is to look at a much smaller level of, um, I have to write a piece of software, for example, or I have to dig um, a single ditch. And so it's looking down at the details of one of the rocks in a prying probe. Uh, prime proxies to one of the rocks about how does Brad Hodgins dig ditches and how long, how fast do I dig ditches and looking at my history of digging ditches and all that, all that work, it's all at a very individual level. While the proxy tables that we talked about before across a team level to be an average or an army of one would be the individual. But the reason why we do probe is to have a process for planning that you use over and over and get used to and you get comfortable with. And like you saw that, that chart that spins around that you do some things, do the work, take the data and do the next one. So having that, you wanna figure out a way to, to estimate sizes and labor, estimate them and have them be close to what it really took how big it really turned out to be, how much time it really took. And to be, I'd say within 10%. I wouldn't try to get any better than that. You're doing great even within 10%. That's the word we use. You get within 20%, you're good. Within 50% and you're salvageable, we can make it better. Then 20%, you're doing good. Plus or minus 20% off the actuals. Plus or minus 10%, you're doing great. Keep it up, you're, you're right in the zone. So, <clears throat> So probe allows you to measure uh, the size, plan the, plan the size and get the actual size for the work you're doing. And it's a vehicle for doing that to another level of degree over what you just saw us using a, a table to say, well, that's gonna be a big paper or small paper. This is now going down in the details, one more level. I'll explain that in, in the next slides. And what this does is when an individual uses probe to estimate a rock, about how long does it take them to do that rock? Yeah, the launch we said it was gonna take 20 hours, but I used to use probe and I came up with 35. You have a defensible plan of why you think it's 35. You've broken it down to more detail and you may have uncovered something that the team didn't see at its 10,000 foot level when it was doing the launch. And it's realistic, it's based upon your performance. So all these things that make it, you have a, a you have something to stand up against and stand on to defend it. 
and it's an it's a further refinement of any lot any estimates made during the launch. So this is again done in one of the rocks to blow it down even farther. So as a background, we're going to talk about some stuff in the beginning about why do you even need to have plans in the first place, just to make sure people aren't completely lost on why we're doing probe down to this level we are. But most of the slides are going to be talking about uh, probe. All right, so let's jump through that list. So why need plans? Well, you make plans so you can tell someone when you're going to have something done. And that's a commitment. So when they say, hey, I want you to dig these three ditches and write these three white papers, you use probe to determine how long it's going to take you to dig those ditches and write those white papers. You come back and tell someone, yeah, five weeks. And then that plan can be used to guide whether you're on track or what does you don't forget what you're doing over those five weeks. And then tracking your work, you can see if you're on track to finish in five weeks. That's what you use plans for. Otherwise, you put your finger in the air and say, hey, in five weeks, and then you'd go off and you'd work. And the person you, if you don't have a plan, the person who wants it heard you say five weeks and say, are you almost done? Oh yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'll be done in time. And then you rush back trying to catch up because you think you're behind, you don't want to tell anybody. Plans are to get away from all that subjectiveness and get into the objective world. All right, so now to make a plan, you have to understand the requirements. This is just paraphrasing what happened in the first half of the TPI class and, and some a little bit you saw earlier. You have to understand the requirements so you can do that conceptual design, identify the rocks. You have the rocks, you then estimate the size of each rock, estimate the labor for each rock. And again, those might be different. A ditch, linear feet per hour, white paper, pages per hour. You have all these different productivity rates, but you're turning them all into time. And then you take those rocks, turn them into tasks, and then you have a pile of tasks. They all have estimated times. And then you got a thousand hours of work to do in five weeks? No way! And all your friends come to help you and say, well, maybe we can all get it together and get it done in a month and a half. But you make a schedule. That's driven by assigning those tasks to individuals on the team. And that is more hands make less calendar time. All right, so here's that picture we saw earlier. And this dotted line is the problem area is how do you go from requirements to having a schedule where it says, hey, we're going to get done in, in three months? How do you go from, dig these? I want you to dig these ditches, write these white papers, teach these classes, and write the software, and then end up with being able to tell someone, yeah, it takes us three months to do it. This is the problem in here. And these steps about making a conceptual design with the rocks and estimating the sizes and the times for those rocks, that's all driven on what are typical lengths of ditches, what are the typical size of white papers, what are the typical size of software that you wrote in the past. Given that these are similar, the requirements you've been asking now are, are similar to what you've done in the past, you can look at your past and say, well, how fast am I? How fast is, our, is the team? <clears throat> and once you have that pile of, of rocks broken down to a, a pile of hours and tasks, then your schedule is going to be driven by how many hands do you have available to work that pile? And those people are going to work at those productivity rates that you assume. And we have at people in Avair, we have people called new professionals, which we then turn their productivity rates to half of what a veteran is. So we give them more time, or I'm sorry, we double the time for them to get a job done that a normal veteran would do, uh, uh, someone who's been in the field for a long time. So buy them, give them more time to get their bearings and doing the work. And each team has a different culture on that about how long they, they have the new professional work at the double, at the half the rate or double the time. They have to get their feet. But this is the world in here, turning that, that set of requirements into a pile of rocks, into a pile of sized rocks, timed rocks, and then tasks. All right. So it's a problem. And the reason why is because especially with software, it is very difficult to look at requirements and say, oh yeah, that's gonna be a thousand lines of code. You cannot think in lines of code. So it doesn't help you. And so it's tough. And so the trick is to figure out some way to handle this so that you go from requirements to lines of code in a way that you can go, yeah, I feel pretty good about this. So let's talk about an analogy of the approach I'm gonna introduce you to. In a very similar fashion, 
you may go up to a con building contractor and say, I want a house. I heard you're good at it. I know exactly where I want it built. And I can tell you what I want. You tell me how much it's going to cost. And the guy turns around and says, sure, start talking. And he gets his clipboard out. And while you're talking about how many bedrooms you want and how big your kitchen you want it to be, and oh, I want to walk in, walk in shower in the master bathroom. And and I want a formal dining room in the living room. He's checking a little box and making little notes on his clipboard. Then he goes, what do you think? He turns around and tells you 250,000. Or if you really live in DC, 5.3 million. <laughs> so he has a number. And you go, how did you do that? Well, you were talking about small, medium, and large rooms. And the number of them, different kinds of rooms. Bedrooms are different from bathrooms, different from kitchens, different from living rooms. And he has those different kinds of rooms he has to build. And he has what a medium bedroom is and a medium living room and a medium kitchen. Those are different sizes. And believe me, they're relative to his world. Ridgecrest, totally different sizes than, say, a penthouse in New York City. Totally what, what a average bedroom size, totally different. Right, so it has to be relative to where they're working. Okay, so uh, how do you come up with that? All right, so he's got on his clipboard this little table here. It says, well, if he says small bedroom, that's going to be 225 square feet. How do you get that number? He's built houses. He's measured the actual sizes of the houses, of, of the rooms that he has built for people in Ridgecrest or in people in D.C., a townhouse in D.C. Very different. Um, and so he has it relative to the area he's working in. So how do you get that number? Well, you add up all the bedrooms. Not that you don't know the small and medium and larger. He just takes all the bedrooms he, he did, added them all up, and divide by the number of bedrooms. And that's where the 225 came from. That's the average size of the average bedroom. And then he halved it and doubled it or something similar to that and, and to make the small and the large. There, there are more complicated ways to do that, but I'll, I'll just take the high level and have it and double it. Same thing with bathrooms. Bathrooms are an average of 225 feet. If you look at all the bathrooms that you've been in, you probably eight by 10 is probably on the small side. Maybe even a half bath would be six by 10. But, but on average, a typical bathroom is about 120 and a master bathroom where you walk in and swing a cat around in might be 10 by 20 or 15 by 15, right? So, so you have this high end and low end but they're average, basically in the ballpark. So you're, you're saying small, medium, and large, you're waving your hands and he's checking off these pieces. And then he just does the math and adds them up. And as we're talking about on here, takes all the individual estimates together and they're all wrong. The point about this analogy or this approach is you make a bunch of individual estimates knowing that they're all gonna be close to the actuals. So you're not going to try to get exactly. You just want to get close. And you know that some of the estimates are going to be on the high side, some will be on the low side, and those errors cancel each other out. So you have this wonderful phenomenon where the, um, the, the total estimate gets seriously close to the actuals, and you're going, I don't deserve a number that good. My individual estimates are way off. Now, there's more than just taking all the rooms together. There are other things that I didn't mention, like hallways and closets that are in the square foot of the, of the house. And this contractor knows typically what percentage that is. So he'll add a chunk to it before he gives you the number. So if you want 20, bathroom, 20 bedrooms and 10 bathrooms, you got a big house, you have lots of hallways and closets. It's a ratio to the, to the size of, your, of what you've told him. So he tacks that on without even telling you, and it gives you the size estimate and multiplies it times his, his cost per square foot and you have your number. So he knows this, it's his world. Well, when you use probe, you're using it in a world that you know about. So let's talk about software. So you're working in software, you have requirements. And the trick is you have to try to figure out what are the parts of software you need to write to be able to implement a solution to the requirements. Now we're doing this before you do real design, but that's why we call this conceptual design. You stay at 10,000 feet about the requirement. So say if the job is to write and implement some kind of uh, some kind of algorithm to to come up with a uh, an average of a bunch of pieces of data, well you know that you have to read in the data and you have to do the math and you have to print out the result. There's three parts right there. 
So you, you're doing this in your, in your head, you write down on paper and you break it down. I did a really simple one there, but you're basically breaking down what are the pieces I have to have in my program that would implement the requirement, which is to, hey, I want you to get a, a print, write a program that, some, that does the average of these numbers I'm gonna give you. Now there are types of parts, I'll get to that next, and the relative sizes, you may say, oh, that's gonna be a really easy read in of the data. And the math, oh, the math looks pretty straightforward. That might be a small or medium. And, and so you're talking about the, the size of these pieces of your software. And the same kind of analogy, you're gonna have a table. And that table is gonna be the, the type and size of your parts. Where part might be a class or a function or method. And that's your, instead of rooms in a house, you have classes and, and methods. And so you take all those estimates, add them all up, and then you can look at your productivity and size per hour and you end up with a time. Similar to what the other guy did with the, the, the customer waving their hands, talking about number of rooms and big and small, and he takes his cost per square foot and he comes up with a dollar amount. So, Let's talk about these pieces I just mentioned, conceptual design, just to cap it, to, to talk about it a little bit. So you have this requirement, write this program that comes up with this average. All right, so you have to figure out what are the parts you're gonna make? And if it's a simple enough problem, you could probably think I can just hash it out and slam dunk as one giant function, but no, this concept, uh, this approach works best when you have a, a modular design where you break the pieces up into highly cohesive, I do one thing, a function does one thing, and relatively low coupling where they, they kind of work, they, they take a couple of things in, a couple of things out, and their job is focused. If you think object-oriented or a modular breakout, you're gonna work great with this. But if you try to make everything a 500 line main, you're not gonna get anything on a conceptual design. So you gotta break it up into pieces. This is the world where you have a main that, that basically is a, calls other functions to do things. It doesn't do anything itself, it just, waves the baton and tells other functions to do stuff, other methods to do stuff. So that's where you, where you, how you gotta think about when you're using, using probe is that kind of level of design. Uh, now in a, in a white paper, if you're doing a white paper, you would do conceptual design on the chapters. How many chapters are I gonna have in this? How many things do I have to talk about? And then you talk about the chapters being small, medium, and large. Same kind of idea, but you'd have to be at the point where you know what a small, medium, and large chapter is if you write books for a living or write, uh, 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 status reports for a living, if that's one of the things you do. So uh, so they, that's the conceptual design is again, it's on a white paper or a whiteboard, something, You're, it's, it's spatial in nature and you lay it out. You don't go into details, you just trying to figure out what are all the pieces I have to have to my solution to be able to implement, implement a solution for that requirement. And we're talking down, down in details. We're not trying to do, well, we're gonna put a new weapon on an aircraft. Conceptual design, you may use it for that. You're gonna have a really complicated conceptual design if you're gonna do something as high level as, but no, that's really, that's a launch at level. The, the probe we're talking about here is down at, they want me to add a button to a display. They want me to add a new weapon to a list of weapons on the aircraft in this status inventory. So a very small part of a big problem. This is not meant to be thousand line, thousand line development efforts in the, using probe. Okay, so it should be done quickly. You should have the scope of a small enough that you're going, oh yeah, okay, I can see this. Because conceptual design is still high level. And you're just trying to figure out what are the functions of the modules that you need to have. You don't have to have all the details and know, know the syntax of everything. No, you just don't want to say, that one's going to do the reading and that's going to do the math, that's going to do the print. Yeah, I'm there. <clears throat> now, you have the rocks and they are classes or methods. Now you gotta say, what kind of class or methods are that, is that, what kind of method is that? And you have your table like the, like the house construction guy. You have the small, medium, and large, and you have the types of methods, synonymous with the types of rooms, calculation methods that do mostly math, IO methods that do mostly reading and writing, logic methods like the main, doing the doing the uh, conducting, calling things and controlling the logic. No, this is a green thing. So we're gonna call these three functions. Oh, it's a red thing. Call these five functions. It's the one directing the logic and the behavior. And 
by having it being modular, your methods should be in mostly one of these categories. I won't pretend it's going to be perfect, but these are the categories as an example about what your method should be focused on. Highly cohesive. I focus on doing math. I focus on doing the reading in that stuff. I focus on writing out the output. And so these fall into these categories. So if you have a, a main that does all these things together, it doesn't fit any one of those categories. And none of these numbers are going to help you estimate a, a 200 line method uh, main function. It's not even on here. So those are the three main ones that calc, IO, and logic. And in computer science-wise data might be your headers and stuff like that. So, and then set up or gets, and, uh, gets, gets, and, uh, gets and sets might be your, or constructors and destructors, maybe. All right, so, uh, so that's what he's using to turn the conceptual design into sizing the classes and the methods that you identified in your conceptual design. Rarely will you work from a blank slate and you will have to be modifying existing code. So one of the things we're going to talk about here is you're either going to not touch whatever code is there, or you're going to be changing lines in it, adding lines to it, deleting lines from it, or modifying lines that are in there. So we have to identify those and, and be able to, to say how much we're going to touch. It's like adding an adding addition to a house. The, the, the builder guy is going to say, how much we mess with the current house? I rerun plumbing, and those are going to take time to do that. You're going to add that to the square footage of your addition. So I'll talk about more than a second. So here, here we have a graphic, a simple graphic. You have conceptual design is the first thing you do. And again, that's on paper on a whiteboard. And then we're going to go into the size, the WBS, and we're going to identify those, or sorry, not WBS. We're going to go into um, the size of the main template. That's where our focus is going to be. That's the uh, the WBS editor for a single rock. And so you're gonna identify the parts you had in your conceptual design and what types are they? And the table, you're gonna use the table to pull up the type sizes. And if it's a class, you're gonna say, well, I got three medium IOs. So sometimes you have single line will be a little naturally occurring group of methods. And then there's some other stuff that will be added in like the 10%, 20% bump up. And that'll give you your size an estimated size. And then from there, you will determine your time by using a productivity rate. So in a nutshell, that's the breakout. You see it's very similar to what we did in the, in the uh, launch or the conceptual planning of the whole project. It's conceptual design, got the rocks, size the rocks, tie in the rocks, break the rocks in the task. You don't do that here because the steps you're taking here are all right, so this is identifying the types, calculation versus an IO. In a class, a single line, you might have multiple methods in the class. So you take, these are all a bunch of medium IOs. And you do the math, it does the math for you. Five functions, I'm sorry, five functions at 10 lines each, it's gonna be 50 lines. So let's take an example of this. I've been waving my hands for half an hour. All right, so uh, we have JD. And JD's name comes from something way, way back in the SEI world, JD developer. Boom. Yes, bad pun. So JD has a new assignment. And again, we're talking about probes. So he's going to be looking at something that's uh, relatively small, a couple hundred lines. Uh, and so his requirements are to write a program that calculates the mean and a standard deviation for a bunch of numbers. That's his job. And He's got, he has imposed upon him to use a linked list. So you have to read them in, put them in a linked list, and then do the math and print out the results. And all of you are going, dude, this is like from the PC fundamentals class. This is a great illustration of, of probe from what, the stuff that I have. So you're gonna see some slides from the PC fundamentals in here. All right, so his first step is planning. And so he turns on the timer on his dashboard to planning, which is the first step in his set of tasks and everything we're gonna do here is part of planning. Then we'll fast forward and go to, to the retrospective and it'll capture the actuals, but we're gonna do a bunch of stuff in planning here. So he makes a conceptual design. His conceptual design, his main is going to call these five functions, five methods. And so 
He has a input function, a method. He has a linked list class, calculate the mean, which works out the linked list. Calculate the standard deviation is gonna need the mean and it's gonna work out the linked list. And it's gonna print the results out. So there's the mean and standard deviation that he has to compute. And he broke it up in a modular way. Way to go, JD. So he identified his parts. So now he looks at them and says, okay, what are the parts like? He goes, well, the input data is obviously an IO and it's just one method. The end is gonna be average in size. Linked list, well, it's a bunch of data pieces, a bunch of holding the, you know, a node holding a piece of data and a holding into piece of data. So I'm gonna have a couple of functions like gets and sets, stuff like that. And they're all gonna be medium. Now, how does he know medium? If I look over here at the list and say, well, data, well, it's two and a half lines way too small. 30, 30 is way too big. I think they're gonna be probably half a dozen, half a dozen to a dozen, somewhere in there. And so he looks at this as the typical, some might be smaller, some might be bigger, but the five of them, maybe they'll average out to 40, 50 lines. That's what he's doing. Now, what are all these fractions come from of, of lines of code? This is just by taking where this table came from, 810 students working in C++. They took all their calculation functions, add up all the size of the functions and divide by the number of functions. They got 11.25. And then they took a statistical attack on it with standard deviation. Don't want to get in details, but pretty much halved it and doubled it, pretty much. And I have all the details in here so that we don't round off, round off, round off and lose. So it just carries over, all the fractions carry over, we don't care. That big number 11 or the nine, that's what you're looking at. And then the other, other three, the same thing, identifies them as a type and looks at the, at the, real, at the size and goes, that's too big, uh, that, that's about it. That's where he's going from. So now in the tool, the table is in the tool and the table populates these fields over here, the size field for you automatically. You're not forced to use this field, this table, you can build your own. And if you have enough data, you can compute your own. Those tools are really easy. Uh, I've got a number of Excel workbooks that do it. Um, and then here's the, here's the type of each of the, uh, of the five pieces he's gonna have to write. And there's the types that he wrote down on the piece of paper. And there's the number of items. You see that link list is a class that has five items, five methods in it. And there's the sizes and, and the tool uses the type and the relative size to go to this table and populates the number. Notice the 44 is five times the 8.8. .8. Again, that's where we carry over all the fractions. And so you don't make up these numbers. You just identify the type and the relative size. You know what the table looks like. You can pull it up and have it beside you. And you kind of say, yeah, that sounds about right. And you know if you made it a small or a large, it's too small or too large. So this is your best of, your, the least of, the least of the uh, evils. And so these are gonna be your gouge. You add them all up, 113 of new software. Now, going back a second, those chapters, you might have a summary chapter and a content chapter and a, uh, or portions of a paper, table of contents, uh, a chapter body, um, uh, index. Uh, these different kinds of animals would have different small and larges. And you do the same thing with a white paper. All right, so now if you have to modify existing product, then you have to understand how big of a base you're working from and how much of it you're gonna mess with. And you have to be able to size those and, and measure those to be able to determine not just adding new pieces, but I have to touch existing pieces. Now, graphic wise, you think of this as the circle here on the left, that's what you start with. And I'm using words here about a software, but this is applicable to a white paper. I'm gonna add some more work to existing book or existing user manual. Uh, and so you can say some of it, I am gonna get rid of. Now this is not to scale, <laughs> but you would get rid of some of it because you, it's, getting, it's OBE, OBE now. Like if you're gonna build a new program for an old program, some of it does stuff you don't need to do anymore. If you're gonna use a white paper that was on one topic and, and just grab, grab it over and then get rid of pieces you don't need to make another white paper, like a status report. This would be a good one for status report where some stuff comes over and you run the same format, but that some of the guts change and some of the pictures get updated. 
And so you would delete part of what you brought over. You would leave some of it alone and you would modify some of it that you brought over. Okay. So, um, so now you've got what survived that you brought over, some stuff you didn't touch and some of it you modified. And then you're gonna add on to it your new code or your new chapters. And so this circle here on the right is the, the what you're gonna turn in. Now, <clears throat> JD looks at the base that he has to write. He's gonna add this capability to an existing program that's currently 224 lines code. He goes, well, I'm gonna modify a little bit. And he thinks about it this way. Exceptional design, you don't wanna go through the code and say, I'm gonna modify that line, delete that line. Nope. You say high level and say, I think most of it's okay. I'm not gonna delete any of it. I'm gonna modify 10% of it and add onesie twosies to some of the functions and then add my new functions to that. So this is this is the onesie twosie additions to existing modules. And these are the changes to existing modules. So the stuff he's gonna add, the whole five new modules are in addition to this. So to enter that into the tool, we encourage them to think about the 10%, 5% thing. And so there's this cool capability that uh, Tuma came up with that you have these sliders. Instead of entering the numbers where you're tempted to go 21, uh, 22, maybe 23, and you start to go analysis paralysis, and you're going through the code, looking at it. No, you want to stay high level. You say 10% is about the ballpark. And so you would then type in this number of 224, and then you'd grab the sliders, which all start here, and you, how much are you going to modify? How much are you going to delete? And each tick is 10%. And then how much are you gonna add? You drag it over, then bring it back, in this case, 5%. So those are all physically relatable. And you don't care about the numbers here, but you can touch it and override it. You'll see that in the demonstration. But the trick is you have sliders graphically thinking about 10%, 20%, 30%. <clears throat> now, the stuff we talked about earlier with the parts additions. So here's what he's gonna do to the base. Here's what he's gonna add to the base. So these changes and these changes are the total of the work he's going to do. This could be 5,000. And if these are still 22, 12, and 113, that's what's related to his labor. It's equivalent to that decorator having this massive display, but they're only going to change one little part of it. The rest of the display is a no-op. It's going to be there, stay there. I don't have to touch it. There's 5,000 items in the display, but I'm going to mess with these 25. And they'd have a base of 5,000, but they would only... Uh, add a couple, pour down a couple, and then uh, so a small fraction of it. So the base doesn't influence the time. It's how much you modify, how much you add, and the new parts, the new functions, the new mannequins, the new, new chapters. So one of the things on this page here, um, we're talking about coming up with a raw estimate, which is those things. That, how much you're going to add to the base, how much you're going to modify from the base, and how much you're going to add is whole new parts. Those are the abbreviations we had in the previous part. That's your raw estimate. Now, I talked about this as being a technique for each probe is to be able to look over your shoulder and, and have, it, have an estimate that takes into account your ability to estimate. So one of the things that you can do is if you have a history of using probe, you can say, what are, how much actual code have I written in the past using probe? That's relevant to what I'm about to do. And how big did I estimate it was going to be? So if you're good, this ratio might be near one. If you're bad or you need more work, need help, this might be 80% of the estimate or it might be 120% of the estimate. And I'll make a ratio, a number like 1.2 or, or 0.8. And the point here is that this shows your propensity or your bias when you make estimates. In the case where this is bigger than the actual size, then it says, well, you tend to overestimate. And so if you take that ratio, that 0.8, because your actuals are big or smaller than your estimates, multiply it times your new raw estimate, and it's going to scale it down. Says, well, if you tend to underest or overestimate, let's assume you've done that this time also. Let's bump down your 300 and knock it down 80% to get 240. And so this is our refined estimate, a modified, a projected 
estimate from your raw estimate, looking at your history of making estimates before, all using probe. Now, if you do white papers, you're gonna have a different size, uh, a different, different bias than when you paint houses and when you dig ditches. So at some point you really separate these and you don't try to munge all your sizes of ditches and sizes of white papers together. You probably want to break it up in, into having your probe focus on, I'm gonna do software. And you have another rock that you're going to probe and say, I'm gonna dig a ditch. And you're now looking at the history of your digging ditches, history of writing software, history of painting houses. So you don't try to mix them up in here. You're looking at apples and apples. Now, you have the option to say, hey, look, I don't have a history. So probe gives you a chance to pick method D and says, my raw estimate is my estimate. But this is your chance here. And there's other methods A and B that do further refined uh, statistics on, on your history of different ways looking at it to modify your raw estimate to come up with a commit estimate. This is a, my estimate based upon my past performance. Now, here's the example for JD. He adds up his pieces. Here's his base additions, modified addition, or a base modified and his new parts. Comes up with 147. He doesn't have a history, so he's going to use method D. And so his committed or probe modified estimate is still 147. But if he had a history, and I'll show you an example, uh, then it, it would be different from 147. It'd be bigger or smaller. But you wouldn't like double it and triple it. So it, it should be a tweak to it. So it bottom half of the probe window, to the top half we just showed you earlier, bottom half gets into that where you go into the probe wizard and you say, well, I've got an estimate now. And then this is, this is turning your, your raw estimate into a P. It takes your raw estimate, 147, you go through probe, and I'll go in a second, and you end up with P. Now, JD doesn't, didn't use an option, so it stayed 147. But most of the time, you'll have a history, and this number down here will not be 147. It'll have some scale applied to it, like I just showed you on method C. It has a scale like 0.8 or 1.2. It'll be a different number, and that number is being used to come up with the time. All right, so let's talk about effort now. Finished estimating the size. That estimated size is used to compute the time. So if you have a history, then it says, how much time have I spent on past ditches that I've dug? And how much, how big did I think those ditches were going to be? Notice it's not using the actual size of the ditches. And it comes up with a ratio. And this is a time per size. And you multiply your E, time over size, yeah. Multiply it times the size and you end up with a time. And so this is converting your estimated size to an estimated time. Now it doesn't, this is, this is one version of C using estimated size. There are other ones who have the actual sizes that those actual times are spent on. And I have teams using that. That's the actual productivity rate. Well, I spent so much time and I improved so much software. Here's my next piece of software. Okay, that's how much time it's gonna take. It appeals to them, they like that, they understand it. And there are other methods that are more, um, more insightful if you're good enough with your estimates, but this is just the one to, to, to go with if you have a history. And if you don't have a history, you tell me how much time do you want? This is where Andy went. Andy just said, hey, look, give me, give me uh, five hours. And so the tool allows you to say, how much time do you want? You don't have to have a history. So in general, what we're doing here is you go into the wizard, to come up with a method for how you want to take your raw time, raw size and turn it into a updated size. And you have um, then turning that into a time. And so there's two methods and they're separate methods. You may, like A and B are statistically more uh, insightful than taking an average. Or, hey, look, I don't have a history, so just use the raw. Or just give you, I'm gonna give you a time, give me five hours, All right? Those are your, those are the last option you want. You want to try to use method A, work to method A, but you can't use method A from the beginning. You have to earn that right by being consistent. Okay, so they're separate. I had people that are good at estimating sizes and they could get to method A for taking their raw estimate turned into an actual, uh, a refined estimate for size. But they were all over the place for time and they had to use C 
uh, or D because they didn't like how C was taking them. And so they didn't have a handle on estimating si time, but they had a handle on estimating size. Eventually, as you look at this and you work on improving the way you use probe, you'll get to the point where your assumptions that you are making and the history you're using will allow you to, to get to the point where you get because cuddle up to that 10% mark and you're now working and making estimates that are within 10% of size and 10% of time. And then people want you. <laughs> you run away there. People want you on their team. People want to give you their work and they know that you're going to make a good uh, commitment to your dates. So what does it look like? I have a, two things here. One's a couple of number of slides we'll rip through and then we'll have a video of it being used. So here is that pro, which is in the middle of this sheet. The top is that first part where you have the base and the parts you're gonna to add to it. And the bottom is those two columns that get filled out when you go through the probe wizard. So going through the probe wizard, it says, welcome to the probe wizard. And there's step one. I saw 102 lines of code. Now this is, a, this is not JD. I'm picking one that has a history. 102 lines of code on, uh, on your raw estimate. This is from the changes to the base and new parts. So it's a, this would be your chance to say, oh no, it shouldn't be 102, it should be different than that. Um, you can close this and go back and look at the top half of your size main template and go, oh yeah, I, I forgot to add a piece or I, I picked the wrong option on one of the sizes, row of sizes. So if 102 sounds right, then yep, that's what I have, then you hit continue. And uh, it then shows you step two, your history. Here's five programs you have done that are relevant to the sixth program you're working on. Here's the data you have on plans and actuals on sizes and times. How are you looking with that? And you may say, oh, I didn't know what I was doing. I want to make some of these. I'm going to exclude them from being part of my history because I was really messed up. And so an outlier, and you click on that hyperlink, outlier gives you the definition of what we're talking about. It's not data you don't want to use because it makes you look bad. It's data that you know was aberrational. Oh yeah, I was totally messed up. I was logging. I wasn't logging the right amount of time. I didn't size it properly and all, all these things. I was totally wrong in the process. I'm not like that anymore. Don't use it. As opposed to, oh, I wish I was faster. I don't want to use that. I want to maybe look bad. That's not an outlier. So we're talking things that are aberrational and, and atypical. Uh, from what it should have been. So you weren't following the process, you had something broken, it was a ton of research and it made it look really big. That's what we're talking about for outlier. So you would have a chance to flag some of these as exclude them and don't use them going forward. Now in step three, this is where we're getting into uh, taking your history and looking at taking your raw estimate and turning it into a uh, projected estimate. So here's these methods C1 or C2, C1, B, B and A, how come they're not in alphabetical order? These are statistically most sound, and these are statistically the least sound, and these you can't even use because you don't have enough data, or the data is not good enough. And so they only give you an option to pick A and B, either because you don't have enough data or the data is so inconsistent, you can't use it. And so here's a different C1, C2, they're different, looking at different combinations. And you can click on these, on the methods or on the charts, and they show you your data. So this person has six pieces, of, five pieces of history. Here's four of them that provide data for this example where it has an estimated size and a, an actual size. This first program didn't have estimated size. So there's only four data points here, but it looks at them and draws a best fit line through zero, zero and through them. It goes, what do you think? And if I were to use those, and probe's telling you, if I use these four numbers for ratios, then I would say that you want to multiply your raw estimate by 1.1. And so instead of 102, you should use 112. And, the, and so you look at this and it, it, this telling you, it's recommending this, but you're not committed to it. You have a radio button here. You pick the one that you think is right. You go, well, look at that. Man, this is Jekyll and Hyde. I don't know if I want to take this average. I don't know who's gonna show up next week. And I think this one's more like these three than this one. You can do that. You can make that decision, it's your data. You're looking at it. This might have been your second program. These are three, four, and five, and you go, this is the way I'm working. Your call. Uh, this is using a different combination. I won't get into blow by blow, but um, this is method D. Just take my 102 and leave it straight. And so now you've got your size has been refined. Now this one's working off of, off of turning your raw size into a, uh, a time. And if your raw size is way off, then you're going, oh, 
well, let me just give you a, a time. But if your raw size is close to not being thrown off, like doubled or halved, then you can look at that and say, okay, how's my data look? And you again have these method C and method D and A and B based upon time. And you click on these hyperlinks, these blue text, it gives you the theory behind it. And this is the animation is what you see in the tool. It talks about, well, how does method B for time work? And it shows it takes the data and does this and crawls over here. And then here's your error margin. And that's where the number we're gonna give you right there. And so it, it walks through and explains the math to you while it's doing it. So if you need a refresher, there you go. And so it takes the number and comes over here and comes across here and that could, returns your value. So you have that built into the tool, phenomenal tool. Now in step five, it says, okay, so we got 112 is our new, is our new code, amount of code you added and modified. And then you got three hours for your time. Now those two combined come up with a productivity rate of 37. Your productivity to date is 63. You are so far out of the box with this one. I think you should probably go, I recommend you should go back and look at your size estimate or time estimate and figure out why you think this is so different than your normal performance. And so it tells you you're out of the box. You're so far different from your past performance. You probably want to go back and look at it. And you can blow through and say, no, I know why it's really far different. And you can, you can continue, but it's, it's tapping on the shoulder. Or in this case here, we have a different time. Uh, it looks at two and says, well, it's 51 lock or 51 locks per hour. And that's close to your 63 plus or minus 20. And the plus or minus 20 comes from your variability. How, how much is your productivity varied? And in this case, it could have been as close, as low as 40 and as high as, that, as 80. And 50 is in that ballpark. So it goes, hey, you're being somewhat consistent with your performance. Have at it. Now you have a finish button. So that's how you go through probe in the planning. Same thing as, as in the other piece where you have the identify the rocks, use a table to turn those rocks into sizes, get them sizes, and then use a productivity rate, turn them into times. In probe, you have this additional thing looking over your shoulder and saying, you have a bias and a separate bias about your estimating size versus estimating time. Same kind of thing It's looking to say, you, you tend to underestimate your productivity or you tend to overestimate your size, it, it keeps track of both of those and does that for you. And you have the ability to say, yeah, thank you, but no, your data, your choice, you're not, not a slave to the data. So this is what the bottom part looks up for, for Andy. He had that 147 and he didn't change it, use method D. So his refined estimate is still 147. And then he didn't have a history, so he just used five hours. So he just said, give me 300 minutes. Now, that data from the size of main template moves across the tool into other places and other forms for you automatically. And so you don't have to do all that accounting, the tool does that for you. You just go through here, get your conceptual design figured out, document it on the size of the main template, go through probe and, and decide on how much your history is going to influence your raw estimate to come up with a better size estimate and a time estimate. And that data goes around. There's a five hours and it's broken into, into the pieces that are gonna be used to execute that, the, the steps in that workflow. And then here's that size. Again, it's the added and modified. Not the total size, it's the added and modified we care about. At this point, I wanna show you what that looks like. And instead of trying to walk through a demo live, what I'm going to do is bring up a video and pause the video as we go along and tell you what's doing. Now there's some little garbage down the bottom half here. It's gonna flicker and go, come and go away. So ignore that, that was a conversion from a uh, AVI to an MP4. So pausing it for a second. You have these videos, by the way. There's no audio on this. I wanted to walk through it with you, tell you what's doing. So here's a dashboard. The planning program too. So here's a script. Timer's not going yet. He pulls up the script saying, am I ready to be able to do planning? Looks at the script, enter criteria and says, yep, I am. Good, turn on the timer. Get the timer going. Now go through the steps in the process. And the mouse is moving down there. It says, okay, look at the requirements, make sure you understand them. And this is kind of following the idea that he is working on the tool that come up with the estimate and the 
uh, standard deviation. So now he has root skip design. Notice he's not in dashboard. He's on a piece of paper on a whiteboard and he goes, okay, here's my requirement. And let me pause it. He has to write a program to calculate the mean standard deviation of a bunch of numbers and use a linked list. So he says, okay, I'm gonna have, and this is a, this is an ad hoc version of um, Rumba or uh, last diagram and SML, or, um, UML. Here's the name of the class and these are functions in the class and attributes of the class. And so these are just functions. So it's a way for someone to write on paper if they like object oriented, they can do it on paper without using a design tool. So there's the table he's using and he's identified the pieces uh, that he has to have. And he looks at the table and he goes, okay, now some of this already exists. So we're doing program two. I'm gonna get the main from program one. I'm gonna get the node from program one. So some of it already exists. And now he's gonna add these new pieces. And he says, what kind of method is it? And what size, relative size is it? He flags those. And then he has a comment over here. He says, of my existing code, how much am I gonna mess with it? How much am I gonna delete, modify, and add to it? And this is again, the onesie twosies to existing modules. It doesn't reflect the green stuff here. Those are all new functions. And this number here is five, is, is uh, five percent of however big program one is. And none of it's gonna be deleted from his point of view. So he goes through and he still looks at these tape sizes. He goes, yeah, medium, no, make it a large. I think medium is too small for what I think is gonna happen. And he's going from gouge. This is his, his data he's working from later, but it's the, it's uh, other students now, and he's learning to use it until he gets his own data. So here he has all the pieces, identify where they're gonna come from, but if he has those pieces, he'll be able to do the requirement and that is write the program. And so now he goes into the size estimating template once he's done the conceptual design and he sized the pieces on that paper. Now he's just gonna capture it. Now he's gonna pull up the instructions. The instructions give some more detail here. I might want to fast forward through this. Yeah, so now it's putting some data into it and says, okay, the 0%, the 10%, 5%. So putting the 224, and now he's just dragging the modified over, he dragged the added over, and he comes back roughly half, and he lets go of it, goes 10, ah, make it 12. And so he can modify it, or 11. You can modify it, but the gouges will have them think about the percentages. So you can type in there also. So now he's got the, the raw, the, the base piece in there. Now he's gonna go and do the, the parts. Let's see if we can get to the, there we go. So now it looks at all the green ones and says, all right, let's get the names in there. So you, I'll do one manually and the rest will appear automatically. So the input data is a IO and it's a medium. And we pulls that up, then the tool fills out the 16.2. And then the magic of computers, or here's gonna put in a, a class. So here's, it's very few classes you're gonna have that have all their modules are gonna be the same type and the same relative size. But linked list is an example of it. And so there's five functions or five methods in there. And watch the 8.8 .8 turn into a 40 something. There you go, does, does the math for you. And then there's the other ones appearing automatically related to uh, what we put, did on the white paper. Again, you don't come up with these in the size mean template per se. You can do them on a piece of paper and then just document it in the size mean template. So now I got 146 is our raw estimate. That's the sum of the 133, 113 and the other changes. Now we're going to probe, but click on that, that probe wizard. So. Welcome, and it pops in, it says 146. And yeah, that sounds right. Now we're on step two. I have one piece of history, because it's program two. I'm gonna use it. Now I'm using, maybe it was the other video. <laughs> so so this one's, this one's one step, yeah. Okay, so you know, for size, for time, I gotta enter a time. I have no history for estimating time. So I'm just gonna give it a number. This is like JD now. So I continue. This is 146, five hours, 29, 
lock for hire. Boop. You have no history, so it sounds good to me. And there we go. Now the bottom is filled out. There's that five hours appeared and method D for both those two. And you had the PowerPoint slide that showed you when you have different options. But this video here is just showing you you have one piece of history. And uh, so now he's going through and making sure that everything's done. He's got such design filled out. He's going to look at the other forms in the tool are populated automatically in the plan. There's your size. And then also the time appears in the timing phase. So the data propagated through the tool. You didn't have to do anything. All right, okay. So enough of that one. So now, a couple more slides left. One more video. Uh, I should check to see if there are any questions on that. Okay, so you have that video. So that is a blow by blow about how you should use the seismic template for, um, for estimating the time and size of your product or your work. Now, as a software example, <laughs> but again, you can, the tool can have anything as a units. Uh, I've used it for all kinds of different stuff. Now, fast forward, JD does all the development and ends up with a program which can which does properly compute an average and standard deviation for a list of numbers. Now, there's another last step in his process and that's a post-mortem or retrospective. That's where you, one of the steps is to catch, capture the actuals. In the size of the main template, even though it says estimating, it's a great place to capture the actuals because you can pair them up and say, I have estimates, I have actuals, I have estimates, I have actuals. And you can just go through and do that. One of the problems we found is that people filling out the actual by all the parts was a serious distraction from learning the methodology. So at Navair, what we did is China Lake, we had them not compute this anymore and we had them compute their overall change. So before you would be able to compare each of these values to each other. I planned on the base being 224. Yeah, it, it turns out my base really was 224. There are times where you may forget some other module that existed you had to work with and you pull in and add more rows to it. That's what the instructions talked to I skipped over. But you would be able to compare the modified of that base to what you really modified from the base and what you added to the base to what you really modified. But now I broke that. This 137 does not represent what I modified from the base. It also includes all these new additions too. And this was a compromise that we did in Navair to have students not get obsessed and distracted by trying to fill this out. We were having a 50% failure rate because team because members in the class would get stuck on one of the programs that was required to generate this data and they would not finish the rest of the assignments during the class. And so they never learned the process because they didn't experience it. Or they wouldn't they wouldn't learn the process as well because they didn't experience it. They're stuck trying to come up with a program to generate this data. So we made this adjustment to say, well, let's just work on the next high level up. Because this data is only used really for computing your own table of proxies. And you don't have enough data during this class to generate your own table. So this is something that's more advanced anyway. So this is a compromise getting away from the pure, the pure teaching, but it really worked. We have, I just taught a class in September and I had all six of the students finish the assignments during the class or the next couple of days after the class is over. So it was really good. It's Four assignments that blew through all of them. So anyone talk to me about how you fill these out. So uh, JD had, uh, he did this thing and here I'm gonna hand wave, but I'll show you how, how it's done. He counted his actual size and he came up with a lock counter that the tool had, that the process dashboard has included in it. It measured the base and how much was modified and how much was added and what the total size of the new program was. And this is the information you need to put in that, that place, I'm going back a slide, in this spot here. And the total size, the, the 361, that is the number you need to put down in this lower cell. So the lock counter provides the information you need to fill this out. And so the students can then focus on the methodology and apply this. And then I think this works in the field too, is that people aren't 
confused and, and being distracted by filling this out. They were focusing on how much did I think I was going to do between these guys and how much did I really do. And that's what's helping them proceed on and not getting uh, distracted by the details. So how do they do that? Second video. And then I think we're probably 15 minutes from being done. So now this one is running. I'm um, going to pause it for a second. What we have here is the person is on program two in the postmortem, and they've got to turn the timer on. They know they're doing the, the retrospective postmortem now. And they have the size estimating template up, and you see the fields are blank in the actual and the uh, actual base parts and actual total size. They're blank. This browser window down here will be used during the demonstration. And um, these two file explorer windows will be used during the demonstration. That's what we're looking at here. So now, get the timer going again, or the moving again. So he's looking at the size main template, program two, and that's where he is in the, the postmodern retrospective. So he wants to fill that out. So he's going to invoke this block counter under um, command stack tools. And it, here's a browser window pops up and it says, we're going to compare two directories. So this window came from going to script pull down and going to the lock counter. So now what he's made here is a before folder and an after folder. Now we're working on program two. The lock counter works on comparing files with the same name. So I could have 20 files in each of these and it would compare file to file and use the names to do that. So what I've done here is I have the before, and this is the pro code for program one. And this is program two's code that I've renamed to program one so the lock counter can work on it. Kind of weird in this case, but in the field, in the field, what you're looking at is you're going to have five or six files from the, from the configuration management that you're going to pull out and say, I'm going to modify these five and maybe add two or three more files. And so you have the five files in here and the seven files here. These would be the ones that you ended up with after your development's done. And these are the ones that you started with before you ever touched them. So this is you, you started with, is what you ended with. But all the file names would be the same. All right, so that's what he's working from here. He populated them. And now he's going to take that path and paste it. This is the before, and the second one is the after. And he's populated them with the code before I touched it and the code after I was done making it work. And then he hits the count. And then this browser window down here is going to show the results of it. And it interpreted the code it saw and said, oh, it's C code or C++. And that's a nice feature. If you're not working with some of the given ones, you can make your own uh, definition. But let me, let me go back a second here. So he's now putting his cursor dwelling to the right of the name. And this awesome feature that Tuma put in here is it pops up something you can then grab and left click, drag it over and let go of it. And it puts it in the field. Isn't that nice? No more fat fingering. And if you had multiple files in there, you would have had multiple rows in this table down here and you could drag them all over one by one. Now you also have the total number. So he's put typing it over there, but copy and paste it. But now you've got this little tag here saying, I grab this from a, grab this from the lock counter. And so now he's got this filled out and got this filled out. And that's what he's doing. This is part of a retrospective. There's other parts, but this is the part about the size, how you fill out the seismic template. So on the first part, the planning part, we used the probe. And the second part, we use a lock counter with the before and after directories. Again, it could be multiple files in each of those. Make sure the names are the same and uh, put them into here. Do the lock count. Here's the difference. Drag them over here for each file you touched. So each file has a row in the uh, base parts. When you were making your estimate, if you had multiple files you're going to touch, you would have estimated how much you're going to touch each of the base files. All right. So. Uh, now that video done, any questions on that? Okay, use your mic or type it in. And I think 
those pieces are added now. All right, so wrap up this module. The principal reason using probe is for estimating size and time. Down to the lowest level. I got a rock. I'm going to do that rock in a certain number of steps. Let me refine the estimate by breaking down and doing conceptual design on that one rock and figure out what pieces I'm going to do, like chapters in a white paper, slides in a PowerPoint presentation, uh, ditches in an irrigation system, or modules and software. So this, again, can be used for all kinds of things. You can break down a single rock in the launch. You apply probe to blow it down into more pieces that you can get to the point of say, I know how big that's going to be using relative sizes. And then you take your raw estimate and refine it with your history. The very least, an average with method C. If you're consistent, you can use methods A and B, which just get better and better. Uh, so all your, all your estimates are going to be wrong. <laughs> but <laughs> if the errors balance each other and themselves out, some are high and some are low, some estimates are high, some of them are low, then you get a pretty good estimate overall. And we've seen that. Seen that in the field. I had a team of eight people working for a year, and their size estimate was within 2% of their actual size after a year. And everybody knew they didn't deserve that good of a piece. It was the first time using TSP. And they looked at the individual estimates. They were way off, but some of them were high, some of them were low. And that's the magic of this methodology. OK, so wrapping up. We have questions <laughs> that weren't asked during the presentation. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think that's, that summarized. Uh, yeah, I don't have a summary for the whole thing. What is uh OK, yeah. So I don't have a, a summary of the entire modules. But what I did show you was I talked about how you use personal dashboard, both to make a personal project and in the day-to-day -day use when you're on a team. Logging time, logging mistakes, logging sizes, uh, logging completion dates. And that's your fundamental thing. You want to capture the data as an individual. And that data is then rolled up among your history to help you and rolled up among the team for the team to tell where it is. The second module, I showed you how to use the WBS editor, with actual demonstration. Now, quickly, you can go from a dozen components or rocks to all of a sudden 60 or 70 tasks with a bunch of time scattered and delivered across multiple people. So a very powerful tool. It can really take you there from 0 to 60 in 2.3 seconds. And the third module was talking about how to use size mean template. That's, uh, that's using the conceptual design in a micro level where you're talking about a single requirement of taking it and blowing it down into sub pieces, micro pieces that you're going to do like in software, it's modules, in a white paper, it's chapters, in <laughs> An irrigation system, you got multiple ditches you have to dig. So it's taking something you have to do and breaking it down into small pieces, and you're going to do them one at a time or pieces at a time. That's what you're doing with probes. You're taking one of the rocks and you're doing further estimation and breaking it down. <laughs>